All right, today everyone, we're gonna talk about volatility and NOAC volatility. So um, if you're familiar with hydrocarbons, you know, light hydro hydrocarbons will be something like methane with one carbon, and then you've got pentane with five carbons, and then you've got whole, you know, really, really long alkanes that might end up as, as something like bitumen. And as you go from right, to, uh, sorry, left to right here, what we're doing is we're increasing what we call molecular weight, so the overall weight of each molecule. What that also does is it increases the boiling point. So on the left, you've got methane, that's a gas at room temperature. In the middle, you've got pentane, which is typically a liquid at room temperature. And on the right, you've got something with maybe, I don't know, 60 or 100 carbons in it, and that would be a, effectively a solid at room temperature. So we are increasing the boiling point as we increase molecular weight. And you might ask, you know, why is that the case? Why is it that larger molecules, um, the boiling point is higher? And it's got to do with what we call the intermolecular forces. So um, let's just imagine, you know, pentane as an example. Um, so with pentane, if it was surrounded by other pentane molecules, there are a thing called, you know, London forces, which is a kind of a subset of the van der Waal forces. And so that's the interaction of that molecule with all the others that surround it. And the larger the molecule is, then the more opportunities there are for interaction. It's a very, very you know, basic way of explaining it. Now, you might then actually ask the question, well, hang on, what about water? Because water is a much smaller molecule. It's you know, on the order of magnitude of, uh, of methane. So why is it a liquid at room temperature rather than a gas? And that's because the nature of the bonds is slightly different. We covered this in a, in a previous video, but the disparity in electronegativity values between oxygen and hydrogen and the shape of the water molecule means there's a net dipole across it. And that means that in addition to London and van der Waal forces, it also um, has uh, can form hydrogen bonds. So that's where you know the oxygens, which would be um, slightly charged, are able to um, bond with the hydrogens on the adjoining water. So that means that it has stronger intermolecular forces and therefore the, the molecules hold each other together a little bit more uh, than you would expect for a typical molecule of water size. So that's why it has a, you know, a relatively high boiling point for such a small molecule. So let's think about the, the size of the molecule, but also the, the type of atoms within the molecule affects uh, the overall boiling point. So how does that now um, affect volatility? So if we think about a, a, a lubricant, and if we were to take a, a barrel of some kind of group one uh, lubricant, it would have a distribution of different molecules in it. So there might be some really light ends, there might even be some, some molecules with two or, or three carbons in it, and then there's gonna be a whole bunch at this kind of heavy end as well. Now this middle line is gonna represent effectively like the weighted mean, and that gives you the bulk viscosity uh, properties. So let's say for example, this is a 320 Centerstoke gear oil. Well, we're gonna have a whole bunch of light molecules that contribute less to the viscosity and a whole bunch of heavy molecules that contribute more, but on average, it's a, it's a 320. So as we go, to the right, we are increasing the molecular weight. And um, so over on the right, we've got some heavy stuff and over on the left, we have some light stuff. Now, one thing that we know is that as we more heavily refine and we move from a group one through to you know a group four, the distribution of those molecules becomes narrower and narrower because you are, as you go through the refining process, you're kind of being more selective about the molecules that you pick. So what does that mean for volatility? Well, if you look in the box on the bottom left, the percentage of light molecules in the bulk lubricant is much less for a group three or for a PAO, right? Now, I'm simplifying this a lot, um, but you know it's a, it's a good demonstration. And what that shows you is that there are more light ends in a group one than there would be in, let's say, a PAO. And so you would expect a group one to be more volatile. Now, how does that volatility affect the overall performance of the lubricant? So if you imagine that we have a whole bunch of light ends and light molecules are more likely to kind of evaporate off, well, 
if that happens over time, the distribution is kind of going to morph. So as we lose those light ends, the distribution is going to change. And now if you look at the vertical dotted orange line, it's actually going to shift to the right because now the weighted mean of the molecules uh, in, in the bulk lubricant have gotten heavier. So that's going to mean that your viscosity will increase, right, as we tend to volatilize off. The other thing that it means for something like an engine oil is if you have something that which is high volatility, you'll tend to lose a lot more lubricant over time. And so um, that generally means that things like your top-up rate will have to be higher. All right, how do we actually measure it? Um, there's uh, a thing called NOAC volatility. It's um, there's a doctor, I think it was Kurt Nowak, back in the 1930s came up with this concept. Now it's called ASTM D5800 because it was formalized um, as part of the Testing and Measurement Society. And it's a pretty simple test, to be honest. You take a beaker or some kind of vessel, you fill it up with lubricant, you put a hot plate below it, and as you increase the temperature, you also blow air over the top of it to, you know, get things moving. And over time, you are going to expect some kind of volume loss. And you measure the volume loss as a percentage. Now, obviously, it's fixed conditions because this is a standardized test, but that's kind of the idea behind NOAC volatility. So when you see the number of NOAC volatility, this is pretty much all that it means. And, and if you had a consistent way of measuring this with your own hot plate, then you would effectively be able to do this um, on your own. And that's something that I'll probably do in a future video, just with kind of kitchen equipment. All right, um, that's been a really quick one today, but NOAC volatility is um, one of those foundational concepts that you really not need to understand when you're understanding lubricants and industrial lubrication. So as always, if you've got questions or comments, please leave them down below. But otherwise, this has been Lubrication Explained. Thanks.